Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Arthritis Action Podcast. My name is Mark. I'm the area coordinator for the charity and also your host for today. Uh, joining me on today's episode is Leah, our groups and events manager. Hello, Leah. Hi there. And one of our members, Olga Salm. How are you, Olga? I'm fine, thank you. Fine this morning. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about communication this time and how important that can be for people living with arthritis as it's uh, it's a subject can be especially tricky as it might not be something that you've had to do before, or at least to the extent that you have to do sort of after being diagnosed with arthritis. But anyway, let's let's start off with a little bit about you, Olga. So I mean, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your arthritis? Well, I think we always say we don't want to be defined by our disability. But anyway, my name is Olga Salm. I live south of Norwich. I moved down to Norfolk about 20 years ago. And um, I had a lovely job here, which unfortunately I had to retire a year early because of the progression of the arthritis. I was initially told I needed a new knee and I was told I was too young for a new knee, so I would have to wait a few years. Mm. Um, but I was, at that time, unaware that I had arthritis. I knew I had arthritis in that knee, but I didn't realise it would progress to other joints as well. And that's been a very, very, very difficult learning curve. Mm, I bet. Um, to move sort of on to like, sort of the topic for today, really, so thank you for that, is um, why do you think communication is so important when it comes to arthritis? Well, I think if I, I wish I had been told at the beginning that um, I'll go back a bit because I have worked with people with disabilities for many, many years, children and adults. And going back to the 70s, I worked with a lady who was extremely, well, two people, who were really crippled with arthritis. As a youngster, I never thought it would happen to me. But when I went in to see the doctor first about my knee, it was I was just told about, oh, you need a knee replacement. And quite quickly, I would think within the two years, it got that I couldn't actually do the amount of driving I had to do. And not only that, um, I would go to people's homes and because I did load of home visits, the minute I got to where I was going, I would be scanning the room for a chair that I knew I could get in and out of. And very often I used to have to say, do you have a kitchen chair? Because some of the settees were just too low and too soft. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I don't think it's very professional. If you see your social worker, can't get out the chair. So, <laughs> and so that actually became part of my life, scanning the room, finding something appropriate for me to sit on. And I think then I I said to my manager, I can no longer do the driving. And I gave in my notice. I mean, it was only a year um, early, but I didn't really want to leave my job. But I just knew I was I was becoming a bit of a liability not for me, but for my clients. How long do you think it took for that to like for that decision to set in where you decided that you actually needed to say something? A year. It took a year. Mm. Because I had um I was told, Oh, you have to be sixty five before we can put you on the list for a new knee. And um I tried to hang out for the sixty five for my new knee, but I knew I wasn't going to make it. That's quite a bold decision then to be able to like to do the, all this before you're actually even eligible for the new knee. So very impressive that you were able to do that. Well, it was a hard decision because I loved my job. And um, in fact, I still have very close contacts with the people I worked with. Mm. And um, I actually thought to myself, if I could have um, a, an office based job, I wouldn't have given up but because I had to travel such a lot because we covered the whole county. Plus I was, you know, visiting schools out of county. So I knew I just couldn't keep up with the driving. So how did the conversation go when you had to talk to your, your boss about that? He was very good. I think he was quite pleased because I was quite bossy <laughs> at the office. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, it, well, no, I don't think he was particularly pleased, but he did understand mm. 
And um, but there was no alternative. It was either that or I could perhaps go on the um, access team behind a telephone. And I thought, no, I won't do that. It's always it's always problems. And maybe other people will agree is the more limited your ability becomes, the more paranoid you become about things like where can I park? Can I actually get up the steps? Is there a lift? You know, what happens if the lift breaks down, which it did constantly in the um, block of offices we were working in. And the access team that they offered me a job was the, you know, a level below us. But I would not have been able to get up the stairs without Mm -hmm. a lift. And the lift was frequently out of order. So it's this, I don't want to be a burden. I don't want to have to ask for help. I would rather be independent. So the decision was made that I would stop working. And also, I was actually very poorly at the time. I don't know if it was an arthritis flare-up or or what it was, but I was not well. So that was the decision was made for me, really. Mm. And I couldn't have done without people like the postman and the milkman, because I was living on my own at the moment, because my husband was at sea and both my sons were away. And um, I just used to leave the front door unlocked and the milkman used to walk past with my bottle of milk and, you know, my butter or whatever I'd ordered and go and put it in the fridge, put the kettle on. Often he made me a cup of tea (laughs) and then off we'd go. And that's why to this day I still have my milk delivered because he was a godsend. Mm. That's amazing. So yeah. did, how, how did you get to that stage where you actually, how did you have that conversation on that initial one with a milkman to have him to get to the point where he would come in and literally make you cups of tea? I'm sure everyone wants to know if there's a secret to this. <laughs> no, he wouldn't do it every day or anything. But I think um, sometimes he saw I was really poorly because I f- made myself get up every day. And I would go downstairs and I would... I was told actually to sit with my my feet up. And um, so I used to go and put myself in a chair and it's a little cottage really. So when the milkman came to the door, he could see me through the window. Mm. And um, I don't know how it really started. I think it was, he picked, he showed me the bottle of milk and I just said, oh, come in, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so he found his way through to put, he said, well, I'll put it in the fridge. And I think that's really how it started. And the same, the postman used to come in and give me my post rather than putting it in the post box. And I I bless both of them, really and truly. Mm, That's wonderful you that they're so so, so kind and helpful for all of that. Mm. Is it the same arrangement with the postman as well then? Like they just thought they saw you and you just beckoned them in. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I think they could see I was a poorly soul. Mm. (laughs) Didn't didn't look at my brightest. (laughs) (laughs) So what do you think like some of the challenges are then when it comes to communication? So like you're you're clearly like a very sort of like outgoing person in general. But what do you think sort of like some of the challenges are when it comes to communicating with other people about your arthritis? Well, funnily enough, I was talking about this to my colleague, my friend who was a, co- you know, who I worked with. And I said, all those years I've battled for my clients mm. because my clients were... Um, very well not very disabled but they had specific disabilities and I would battle to get them their specialist um, support or medical needs met I didn't do it for myself I really and and I must have been a pussycat really sitting there at the doctors and nodding my head and not thinking to myself ask more questions but I don't know if you just feel vulnerable. I think maybe that's the word, that you feel quite vulnerable. And um, I had nobody coming in with me fighting for me. Mm. And also, I didn't want to be a problem or, you know, troublesome. Oh, I'll manage. I'll sort it out. Yeah, when I get home, I can work it out. But um, obviously, you can't. You do need that, that help. And I think also... My GP, who was a very, very nice person, if I had a question, that was answered, but there was never anything added to it. 
And I can remember one time saying, yeah, my knee's painful. It really is very painful. But why can't I stand for very long? I wouldn't have thought a sore knee would mean that I couldn't because I couldn't stand and do my cooking. And she said to me, well, that's the arthritis. And I thought, nobody told me that. Mm. <laughs> so it was, I think, years of picking up little bits of information. And to be perfectly honest, I think it was only particularly when you started the Zoom meetings mm. that I started to realise um, that although everybody's different, you know, you can glean these bits of information from each other. Yes, that's suitable for me. Or yes, oh, I understand that. Or there's somebody worse than me. Or pick up a tip. But that didn't come from the doctor. And to this day, it still doesn't come from the doctor. If I hear something on our, at our meetings, I'm the one that goes to the doctor and says, what about this? Can I use this? And to date, I have been told every single time, oh, you're not suitable, Olga. Why I'm not suitable, mm -hmm. nobody's ever explained. Mm -hmm. I don't seem to get a, a, an answer. So I don't know, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> it sounds though like you're doing everything right, like you're going in and you are asking those questions. And I think what you said about some, like over the years, like kind of building up different questions, I think that's absolutely it because it can take, it can take time, I think, as well to build up that confidence to question them, particularly if you think, oh, I'm going to my appointment, the GP is going to tell me what's wrong. And then it's kind of quite a linear process, isn't it? But I think learning those questions to ask and, and getting that clarity can is very difficult. And I think it's easier to do it, like you were saying, when you're in in during your work, when you're doing it on behalf of somebody else, that's much easier because you're in more maybe more in control of of the outcomes but when it's for yourself I think that it's a really daunting process so for me it sounds like you're doing you're doing really well thank you Leah and I I do believe like when I worked with my clients because I had the knowledge I knew where to go I knew I mean obviously I didn't have their disability but I I knew who to contact to find the information for them that was fine but with arthritis, I think I think I've said before, people very quickly, oh, it's just arthritis. And, you know, they don't realize just how all encompassing encompassing it is and the huge impact it has on every single task you do every day. Too many people do dismiss it as not partially because you you know you can't see it, can you? So with most people, it's like if you can't see a problem, it doesn't exist as far as mm. others are concerned. So you, know, you can't really walk around with a big sign on your forehead saying you've got <laughs> arthritis, unfortunately. So I, mean, I guess that's where communication becomes so important to it because people aren't mind readers. So you have to let them know what's going on. I mean, so, so uh, how do you communicate with like either your friends or your family? Because obviously you must have had to explain it to them and have to keep explaining things to them as time goes on. Mm, that could partly be my fault because I do try to stay fairly upbeat. Mm. I don't want pity. That's the thing. Mm. Um, what do they call it? A pity party? Mm. I don't want that. <laughs> mm. <You know? laughs> um, but I see it and I hear it and I really cringe inside. I don't know. I wish people were aware that I don't, it's, it's really soul destroying when you're doing your best to be as normal as possible and you hear people, oh, shame, oh, look at the state of her. God, she never, you know, I can't believe that's Olga, you know, and that really and truly just puts you off. Mm. And what it does really is it chips away at your self-confidence and your self-esteem. Mm. Because at one time I was, you know, the one buzzing about putting out the tables and chairs and things. And and it's silly things like at the village hall, um, which I use quite a lot. Um, I said, you know, the chairs for me are unsuitable. Is it possible for me to buy a chair with arms? Because that gives me independence to get up and out of the chair to go and get my own cup of tea. 
you know, and choose my own biscuit. <laughs> 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 so, um, and luckily, one of the women, she said, oh, I've just changed my dining room set. So we got two chairs with arms. Oh, that's great. It is. And also, it's, uh, uh, in fact, I had a, a re- an upsetting day yesterday because I had to make a decision that I was not going on a coach trip to Ely Cathedral because I realise I can't get up the stairs inside the coach. Mm. And everybody says to me, oh, but the coach is Neil now. I said, yes, I can get on the first step. Mm. I can't get up the others. They're just too high for me. I mean, I'm quite short anyway, but they're just too high. And um, a friend said, oh, well, I'll help you up. And I says, but the other problem is everybody's waiting. Mm. They're either waiting behind me or waiting in front of me. I don't want that because once again, it's, oh, the poor woman. And um, so I actually phoned up and said, I'm not using the coach. I've lost my money, but my Mm. husband's going to drive. Well, my husband's going to come for the day. But um, it's... (sighs) I said to my husband yesterday, I said, my world is becoming smaller and smaller. Mm. My independent world is becoming smaller. Maybe other people have um, ideas, but I am i don't think having a kneeling coach is sufficient mm. for people, you know, with, uh, with disabilities. Mm. Did you speak to the coach company about it? No, I haven't. I will do. Mm, there may be something put in place for this, Ben. And to be honest, if not, another useful thing is if you do tell them the reason that you can't go, if they don't know that there's these reasons, then they can't ever affect any change for it. Because if it turns out that lots of people are having the same issue and they all did mm. speak up about it, maybe it's something they would then have to address and they could fix something. But yes, it it is really important to make sure that you do say the reasons why these Mm. things aren't are, because like I said, if if they don't know, they're not mind readers, they don't know why you've cancelled unless Mm. you tell them. And if it's something, it is something that they could change in future, they need, they need to figure, find a solution for this because there must be one. Yeah. It it is difficult stuff that you're talking about because like, you know, the loss of independence is incredibly difficult. And I mean, is this something that you sort of discussed with like, you know, your friends or your family as well? Yes, because I've got friends, I mean, because we're all getting older as well, of course. And Mm. I've got friends who are getting older and some of them are older than me. So in that environment, it's very supportive, Mm. you know, and we know each other's little foibles and what we can do and can't do. I still have one I have one lovely old friend, she's 93, and she's not totally disabled, but she's obviously very slow. And she keeps on saying, oh, Olga, oh, poor Olga, poor Olga. I don't know whether to thump her or thank her. (laughs) (laughs) I love her dearly, (laughs) but I've got somebody who's 93 feeling sorry for me. Have you have you spoken to her about that? Tell her to tell her to cut it out. Oh, <laughs> that's that's a high road to nowhere. Uh, okay, I suppose that is I suppose that is another important thing to mention when it comes to communication is the the t- knowing when and when not to mm. because is it is it going to be to your advantage or just cause like a maybe a problem that you don't need? Yeah. Like say with with a friend, I mean, if it's something like the coach company or doctors, absolutely speak mm. up and say your mind. But you know. You're just going to upset your friend over it. <laughs> There's no need. <laughs> um, so one thing I did want to ask is like, do you ever like discuss with people? I like, said, so when you're having like a difficult day or if you're in pain, how do you deal with those days? You know, are you able to communicate with those or because I, cause I know you live with your, your, your husband and also your son. They're both actually my husband and son who are both at home at the moment. They are very helpful. In fact, mm. I feel sorry for them sometimes because I feel as though they're at my beck and call. And um, I do try to do things for myself, but I do get cross when I think it'll take me. I have to go and get the trolley. Then I have to go and get the coffee. Then I have to go and because if it's, we make a pot, if I have to heat it up, I've got to take it to the microwave, wait. And then 
that can take me all of 10 minutes just to get mm. a cup of coffee. Mm. If I say to my son, would you get me a cup of coffee? Two minutes is on mm. the table. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, you know, sometimes I, I, I think to myself, oh, I'm just going to ask. I'll just ask. And they don't mind at all. But if I have a really bad day, um, that is more or less due to finding it very, you know, very, very painful. And I think um, I was told you you get flare ups. Mm. And um, if I have a really, really bad day, I don't think it's so much on that day because I just crawl through the day. But it's the next day when I reflect back on how bad I was, then I'll say I'm sorry about yesterday, but it was a really bad day. Mm. You can't spend all your life moaning. No, absolutely not. I mean, having having a having a good attitude, or like you know, having a sort of like what's the word for it? Sort of like a bit of like fortitude to mm. like try and sort of like push through certain things is really important, especially when you have arthritis, because like you say, some of those days are not going to be easy. And mm. yeah, it, it is really important to be able to ask for help. And like, I do understand that it's not it's easier said than done, of course. Yes, yeah. and I, as my mum is still running around, I mean, she's ninety two as fit as a flea and my mum does you know carries my shopping for me and she waits for me she helps me out the car I mean she's very very good about it but I, I can see at times she does get in her mind she's thinking oh before this happened to Olga we used to be out in the car mm. you know we used mm. to have a day shopping we used to have this and and we plan them but they never materialize and I feel um, obligated, I suppose, to take my mum out and about. Mm. I mean, she's very capable herself. I mean, she drives herself around like a bat out of hell. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, she's 20 years younger. She's my age and I'm her age, really. Mm. You know, in ability. I think... I. I I think I said to you before, I think sometimes it's not the physical adjustment, it's the mental adjustment. And I was finding in the mornings, because it does take me a long time to get out of bed and get moving, that I, I wouldn't come, I wouldn't be downstairs until lunchtime. Mm. You know, and I think, God, that's half the day gone. And um what what's happened and it's weird because the time just disappears it can take me well it does if i have to be some be up and out for eight o'clock i have to be up at six mm -hmm. to make sure i can get up washed dressed and downstairs that i guarantee will take me two hours and what i have found i think we spoke about it when we were talking about hobbies um is that i listen to talking books now all the time. I mean, I've even got a little, my mother made it for me, bless her, a little pouch that carries my phone with my <laughs> books in it. Aww. Because I know it's going to take me two hours, but I don't get so resentful now because my mind's busy listening to the book. Mm. Yeah. You know, whereas before I'd be looking at the clock and say, oh, for goodness sake, I'll go make a move, get busy. But I actually f can't physically do it quicker. So having the talking book, I'm so busy listening to that. Mm. Okay, it takes me two hours, but I've had two hours of listening to the book. Mm. Yeah, I like that idea. I think that's that's really good because I think if you can't change how long something is going to take you, can you? But you can change how you feel during that time i think that's a that's a really good idea and you get to get to listen to something interesting as well yes and i think one of the young lasses last um hobbies when we're talking about hobbies she's given me another website mm -hmm. um listening books i think it's called so okay. I'm, yeah i'm going to um because i i use audible at the moment which is really quite expensive but i will um get onto that site as well and i have found that a godsend because i'm not beating myself up 
for wasting time because I'm too busy enjoying what I'm listening mm. to. That's a really good tip. Yeah. I really like that one. I do as well. <laughs> <laughs> So there'll be lots of people walking around with pouches built they, around their necks. Actually, you get, get your mum to set up a side business. You can start yeah. selling them. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Uh, there's one last thing I wanted to ask you before we finish, actually, Olga. Um, so what advice would you give to someone when it comes to communication? So like, if you were to give advice to your younger self, like pre-arthritis or anything, what advice would you give yourself? Well, I think, to be quite honest, information is the key to everything. I'm still not very good at challenging the GPs myself yet. However, I think if I had my time over again, I would start at the beginning by saying, oh, you see, I've got arthritis. What does that entail? Where can I get help for it? Mm. Because I only found your site. Somebody sent me a link. Who it was, I have no idea. But if I had, if somebody hadn't sent me the link to your group, I wouldn't have known about it. That information didn't come from the GP. And there isn't anywhere that you can, where else would you go for information like that? Mm. And I think really um, <clears throat> the GPs could do with an information sheet um, because when somebody, when you're in front of the GP, you've got limited time, but they could give you some information to walk away with. Yeah. And things like that, or even as I used to go until I couldn't get out of the chair to keep fit twice a week where there are suitable keep fit classes, you know, because there are keep fit classes where you can sit mm. and things like that. So I think the GPs could really do with an information sheet mm. just to hand out. So when you come home, you can look through it and say, Oh, I could phone that person mm. or, Oh, that's a website because not everybody obviously is on the internet. But, oh, I could phone that person. And, you know, I think things like your arthritis group, um, that could have that should have been on the list. Mm, definitely. I mean, yeah, if they could just just send everyone to us, that would be ideal, of course, obviously. But <laughs> we do we do try and let as many of them know that we are about as possible. So there are some GPs that will refer people to us, which is wonderful. But obviously, if you if you have anyone you think that any of this information be useful to and you're listening to this, please do let them know. And um, Leah, if you'd like to tell them where they can find out all this information. So we've got some great resources on our website. So we've got recipes, exercises, videos. So many different things all on our website, which is arthritisaction.org.uk. And the groups that um, Olga was talking about, they run via Zoom. Um, lots of different dates during the month, during the day, in the evening. We've got coffee mornings, we've got afternoon teas, um, and we've got a calendar of dates for those on our um, on our website. If you would also like to join in on those, they're a great place to share hints and tips and experiences. Hmm. And if any of you have a, a question or anything you'd like to say or let us know about, you can send us an email at uh, podcast at arthritisaction.org.uk. Great. Well, thank you very much for your time, Olga, today. It's been absolutely wonderful having you. You're very welcome. Thank you. And thank you, Leah, as well. Thank you. And thanks, Olga, as well. Thank you very much, guys. And we'll see you all next time. Bye.